I've been the archivist at Holcomb since March 2017. Um, previous to that, I was a senior um, senior archivist at the NRO here. Um, and before that, I was in a banking archive based in London. I should point out that I am not a historian, but I love the detective work that archives brings. I love being able to weave sources together to build the bigger picture. And I'm hoping that I can share some of that with you today. The talk today really focuses on a few key members of the family and the impact that they've had both within the family and the wider, a wider uh, Norfolk and within the wider country. So we're gonna be looking at um, Sir Edward Cook, Thomas Cook, William Kent, William Brettingham Senior and William Brettingham Junior, Margaret Tufton, who was the long suffering wife <coughs> to Thomas Cook, Thomas William Cook, um, a couple of characters called Biderman and Blakey, who I don't think you'll have heard of, and Humphrey Repton, who I'm sure you have. Um, the most wonderful woman I think that the Holcomb estate has any claim to, which is Jane Digby, and Thomas William Cook, who is the fifth Earl of Leicester. I'm presuming most people will have been to the Holcomb estate, have walked on the beaches, will have drunk cups of coffee in the cafe, will have eaten many of the sausage rolls that we claim everyone eats, um, so you'll know it's a massive estate on the North Norfolk coast, uh, ranging to, at the moment, about 25,000 acres. Um, I should also point out, as many of us know, archives are really full of great, interesting stuff, but they're notoriously dull to look at. Hopefully, there'll be enough pretty things to keep you going and to whet your appetite. Um, and I suppose I ought to point out what the, the uh, cook family motto is, which is prudens qui patens etiam juriam coquit. The prudent one is the patient one because he digests the hardest things. So maybe the dull archives are the hardest things. Ah, oh, here we are. So the first character I want to talk about is Sir Edward Cook. He's this splendid character on the right of the screen. He, <coughs> was uh, born in Milam in Norfolk in 1552. He was the only surviving son of Robert Cook, who was a London barrister, um, and they came from a long established Norfolk family. Uh, Edward attended the grammar school in Norwich before enrolling at Trinity College, Cambridge, but he never actually finished his degree. He left for London and began his illustrious career at Clifford's Inn before moving to the Inner Temple. Uh, six years later, he was called to the bar and he won his first case. Throughout the 1580s and 1590s, Edward became one of the most prominent lawyers in England. He successfully argued um, cases to come before the bar during the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I. He was also did a lot of good for the public offices. He was a JP in Norfolk and Suffolk and Middlesex and recorder of various cities uh, and towns. And he had a long role as a parliamentarian. Um, in 1589 and in 1593, he was Speaker of the House and Commons, and he later returned to Parliament in the, 15, in the 1620s, and he couldn't really work out that it was a slightly odd concept to him there because things had changed a lot in the previous 30 years. By 1600, he had been Attorney General for six years, and he'd be uh, responsible for the prosecution of Sir Walter Raleigh, Lord Essex, and most famously inappropriate for this time of year, the gunpowder plotters. Um, he was a formidable lawyer, and it was said that he was the only lawyer who could interpret and digest the complicated laws of England. His legal judgments and commentaries are still quoted today, nearly four centuries after his death in 1630, 1634-83, which is a whopping age for that period of time. He made an awfully large amount of money, um, at that period, there was an awful lot of cases go between, so a barrister could really fill his pockets. Um, he invested mostly in property. Um, his first property it was bought in Titishall in 1600, um, and he added to his portfolio um, with property in Norfolk, Suffolk, Oxfordshire, Dorset, Cambridgeshire, Staffordshire, Somersetshire and Derbyshire, as well as houses in London. It's said to be about 66 manors, 100 parishes, um, bought at a total cost of £80,000. So he was mega rich. So this document that we've got here is his book of conveyances. It's his massive show-off volume. Um, 
and it records each transaction in date order. So the page that's actually open is open at the entry for Holcomb, um, which as you can see from the slightly bad photograph of the volume, please don't tell Nick when it's rested on the table like that, it's towards the end of it. Um, so it's a relatively late transaction. King James really wasn't very happy with Cook buying up all these properties. And he was worried that he was becoming too, um, he was having too many properties and therefore he would threaten King James. So he called Cook in to discuss the matter. At the point, this point, Sir Edward was just negotiating to acquire another village. And he agreed kindly with the King that he would just buy one more acre. Little did the king realise that Cook was, of course, relating to Castle Acre, a rather substantial purchase. <laughs> Cook chose to invest money in possessions and property. He settled landed property for each of his five younger sons without damaging the inheritance of the eldest. When it was suggested that his high living sons would spend it faster than he earned it, his reply was, they cannot take more delight in the spending of it than I did getting of it. So he was one of these a remarkable men that would be up at three o'clock in the morning, working and working and working. He had this formidable memory to be able to memorize cases and then be able to quote them. Uh, and he was also had a reputation of being a horrible uh, uh, questioner. So I'm not quite sure whether I necessarily want to um, be questioned by him. So this next document, so this is what I was meaning, archives are notoriously bad to talk about when you see them like this. If you were to see it in real life, it's really quite amazing. It's a map of Holcomb from 1590. So it's made before Cook acquired the land. Um, and it's a rather nice map made by Thomas Clark for Anne Gresham, who I learned on Monday was one of his biggest patrons. And I had a researcher with me on Monday and she was enthusing about this map when she saw it as anyone would really. And she was describing it as a bragging map. It's not got any, any use as a, as, a, as a part of your estate documents. It's just to show, ha ha, this is what I own. So this is a bragging map. Um, the little description on the right hand side says, uh, the description of the Lordship or Manor of Holcomb as same lieth within the same and boundaries in the County of Norfolk being a parcel of the possessions of Anne Gresham widow. So <clears throat> the archive at Holcomb is huge. And Sir Edward was brilliant, really, because he kept and worked through all of the previous title deeds that he was bought. And he had quite a lot of maps for areas that he'd also bought. So this is one of them. Um, nearly 20 years later, in 1609, Edward Cook would purchase Neil's Manor. And then three years later, his fourth son, who inherited Holcomb, um, who was called John, married Merrill Wheatley, who was the heiress of Holcomb of Hill Hall, the principal house in the parish. So if I can do this right with my little crazy pointer, this is the rather nice picture of Wheatley and it's the biggest parish, and the biggest manor house within the parish. But actually this little one over here is um, the first bit that he bought. Now, hopefully some of you might be able to see this. So this is the parish, that uh, this is the village of Holcomb as we see it. Um, Obviously, if you've been to Holcomb recently, you'll know it looks nothing like this at all. The familiar things that you might be able to see is this um, bit of water here, which is the Clint, which is now mostly known as the lake. This is Wheatley Manor, which was the manor house before the current Holcomb Hall was built. And then you can see there's a whole little array of houses around here, which was what we were known as Holcomb Town. And then over on this side, I like this, Vicky, this is fun. Over here over the stave is that just up the top of here is what we now know as Holcomb Village. At this point, there was only a couple of houses. Um, so it's a very different scene to what you see now. Um, Meryl Wheatley, who John married, is an interesting character. She was made a ward of court and Edward Cook, who already had his house in Milam, must have thought, oh, Wheatley Manor, that sounds attractive. He made sure he was very much associated with her wardship. She was awarded to his uncle, but on the back of the piece of paper, it has a little note to say, I'm going to be taking a special interest in this case. So it was, was not really surprising that his fourth son managed to uh, marry her. 
Um, I suppose the other thing to point out that hasn't changed is up here, this is still Holcomb Church. Obviously, it's ain't with the burgers. It's been rebuilt and changed a few times since then, but it's it's not it's interesting, I think, that it's up here. You've got the main village over here, and then the stave over there. It's kind of equidistant from both lots of people. So so Edward didn't just spend his money on property. He had an extensive library, much of which is still at Holcombe, um, and was amazingly recognised by his descendants as being important and worthy. Um, all of his books and manuscripts were included in a roll which runs to over 12 metres. Um, the books are ordered by subject and then entries are signed off by Sir Edward. But those eagle eyed amongst you will see this has got nothing to do with books because books are not an area of my responsibility at Holcombe. I just look after the archives. He also made an inventory of his plate, gilt, coins, jewels and other high value chattels in 1631. And I've picked out a few key items that I thought were interesting upon it. Um, we've got down here a cup and cover gilt, um, which has the, the crest of the cook and the Paston's arms on the cup. Now, uh, Sir Edward married Bridget Paston, uh, and it was, it, I mean, it was one of those things that Bridget and, and Sir Edward got married and started having their life together before he really rose into great things. And I think it was probably um, the love of his life, really. Um, <clears throat> she bore him seven sons and three daughters, which at that time was quite a lot. What's more surprising is that eight of them reached um, maturity and they all married into well-established families. Together, Edward and, and Bridget lived at Holborn and in Stoke Poges in Buckingham. And when in Norfolk, they took an active part of the burgeoning county community. Um, I'm hoping that some of you might have been to Tittishall and seen the amazing, the amazing uh, monument to her, which uh, Sir Edward described, uh, has inscribed, Many daughters have virtuously, but thou surpasses them all. Um, he later married Lady Elizabeth Hatton, uh, daughter of Thomas, Lord Burley. And this was a very surprising wedding. Uh, it was very soon after the death of Bridget and uh, both sides probably had good reasons to seek each other out. But again, it was definitely not a love match. Um, it, yes, it was was one of those sort of very out of character type of things and then so totally in character when you know more about uh, Sir Edward. The other two entries some show some of Cook's non-legal interesting the interests. <laughs> it's a list of foreign coins he acquired and collected. Um, so up here I've got uh, coins for Ferdinand and um, Elizabeth, the Spanish rulers from 1479 uh, and there's one for Philip of Portugal and then the bottom here is old English coins um, of things like Henry VIII and Edward VII, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary. So it goes to show that we still keep the same sort of things but he obviously put a great deal of um, thought into it. Right so if we move away from Sir Edward, the fat fortune finder of the family, and move on to this chap. We're moving four generations down, but obviously, as in all of these families, it's not a direct line. It's a sort of a down and around bit. Um, <laughs> this formidable looking man is Thomas Cook. He was born in 1697, the son of Edward and Carey Cook, who both died within weeks of each other when Thomas was just 10 years old. He had three younger siblings. He'd been to Holcombe and they would have lived in uh, Wheatley Manor but they also spent a lot of time in London and at other homes too. On the death of his parents, his minority began and the vast majority of his parents' possessions were sold with the exception of his mother's library, which was full of classics, in particular Livy, um, and a most amazing pedigree of her family back to the 15th century, which was lovely. And I did think about taking a picture of it for you, but I just couldn't fit into the context, but there are lovely archives. Um, Thomas was brought up by his guardians. He was, um, he attended school in Isleworth and he was incredibly 
intelligent, but he was quite precocious um, and he quickly grew out of what the school could offer him. His tutor, Mr Wilkins, described his pupil as a gentleman of extraordinarily good natural parts, a great capacity, who has applied himself extremely much in reading some of you best classic authors and Latin as well as English poets. However, Paul Thomas wasn't particularly physically strong and it was thought that Isleworth might not be the right place for him. In fact, he should go and live with, in his uncle's home in Longford in Derbyshire. His uncle was an, frustratingly called Sir Edward Cook, but no relation to the other Edward Cook. Um, and that would be more suitable for him. Again, he acquired a tutor, um, but he was a bit of a handful, although I think we'd now just recognise that he was a teenage boy. He had needs and wants and chasing the servants, gambling, cockfighting and generally running amok. This was not wanted by his guardians as heir to this massive uh, estate that he might have. Um, he needed to be finished. His education needed to be finished. Um, however, the thought of letting him go to university in this country was just abhorrent on his grounds of health. It was just like, we can't risk sending him to one of those awful places. <clears throat> Instead, they thought sending him to the continent would be a much better idea. Um, little did they know that that would have such a profound effect on Thomas and he would lead to the creation of Holcomb, sort of, as we know it today. So just after his 15th birthday in 1712, Thomas briefly returned to Norfolk um, and Holcombe. He was greeted by his neighbours and tenants before leaving for Dover, where he met his tutor, who was Dr Thomas Hobart of Christ College, Cambridge, and is distantly related to the Hobarts of Blickling. Together, they travelled extensively across France and Austria, Germany and the Low Countries, and most notably Italy, uh, driven by Cook's enthusiasms and Hobart's knowledge of available collections. Um, and this trip lasted six years, so it was a really important part of his life. Um, he did continue his education. He attended various academies where he studied the gentlemanly skills such as riding and fencing, as well as other academic subjects as maths and languages. It was on his first visit to Rome that he took a real interest in architecture and a passion that would remain with him all his life. Um, he would go to villas and palaces and gardens and visit the most notable Roman families and even hired an architecture tutor and bought paper and it's in the accounts as instruments to learn architecture. He also crucially met William Kent who we'll talk about later um, and they both inspired each other. <clears throat> Thomas, his tutor, uh, was really good at finding collections that were available for sale and Thomas was really good at spending money. Um, <clears throat> they drew inspiration visiting various temples and Palladian villas and the scenes that he must have seen must have been the nucleus to what he wanted to create his Temple to the Arts. Um, Thomas returned in May 1718, not only laden with treasures, but educated and refined. And it must have been such a shock to the system, I think. Within two months, he'd just turned 21. He'd reached the majority, had married Lady Margaret Tufton, daughter of the second, sixth Earl of Thanet. Um, an heir was born the following year and he returned to Holcombe in the autumn. Um, Thomas always enjoyed the high life in London and what London society could offer him. I don't think it was quite the same as Norfolk life, um, but he was able to start planning what his life in Holcombe was going to be like and what his new building in Holcombe was going to be like. However, he was a young man and he was a fool and he invested in the South Sea bubble right at the wrong time. He invested a lot of money just as the bubble burst. And so, although he might have planned to start building Holcomb in the 1720s, he had to recoup his money and uh, it would take him quite some time before he could actually start building. So the picture on the right, I don't know if you can see, I don't know if people at home can see even, there's three tiny figures over here. Um, and it's St. Ignatius Church in Rome and it was commissioned by Cook. It was commissioned in 1716. And the figures are Thomas Cook, uh, Hobart, his, his bear leader, and they're talking to a Jesuit priest there. But that's the only, only picture that we know of that exists of Thomas Hobart, which is quite an interesting one. The picture's probably about um, two foot by three foot, so they are really tiny in real life. 
And the picture on the left, I don't need to point at him. <clears throat> this is the famous picture by Francesco Trevisani, who was the go-to portrait painter uh, in Rome in the early 18th century. It's showing Thomas being a virtuoso. He knows about the arts. He knows about culture. He is just there. Um, it's amidst his ornate Baroque surroundings. It's showing his interest in architecture at the back and is showing his interest in antiquity. Um, it reveals how the Grand Tour has transformed Thomas into the fine, accomplished gentleman that the Guardians were really hoping for. But what makes Thomas's Grand Tour so brilliant from an archival point of view, and this is a dull document to look at, but it's absolutely thrilling to read. As we know so much about Thomas's tour through the work of his valet, Edward Jarrett. Edward Jarrett had been with Thomas in uh, Longford in Derbyshire, so he must have known him really well. And he records every single transaction. Well, he records a vast majority, and I would uh, imagine this is every single transaction that Thomas, Thomas did. Jarrett recorded the expenditures. He was able to convert money uh, into the various different currencies of the different countries and different regions that they were in in Italy. <clears throat> and he could deal with the um, agents and money transfers and bankers. And it's quite extraordinary what he recorded. The volume runs to about um, 200 pages. And I could have picked any of those 200 pages to show you really interesting examples. Um, but I'll, I'll try and point out a few things. So here, um, this is his first trip to Rome. Uh, it had taken them two years to get here uh, after spending time and money in France. So the first entry is for paid for great cloth for uh, paid for great grey cloth for a coat and breeches, gold loops, edging, and silk lining. Paid for black damask for waistcoat and buttons, and making the suit of clothes seven hundred and seventy pauls. So it's a substantial piece of of clothing there. And then we've got a substantial piece of clothing, and it's really well described. Then we've got uh, gave at seeing an antiquary. So we know that Thomas went to go and see collections of statues and Roman antiquity uh, all over the place. He was sort of had a slight obsession about it. He was desperate to start his own collection. Um, we've got paid for coffee and a porter bringing pictures. So we know he's buying something. And then I think this is quite interesting. This one paid a surgeon for curing the coachman. So not only is he looking after himself, he's actually then looking after the various servants and things that he brought with them. And then we've got lots of detail. And then we've got paid for pictures, paid for poor pictures uh, from Cortona. So he's not so good at recording the detail of what the pictures and things are. Um, so Thomas goes to Venice in 1717, and we know he went to various mass balls. But interestingly, we've got here note here, paid for taking two boxes of books out of the custom house, paid for a paid more for a box of books from Turin for carrying and duties as per bill. So we know he's buying books from all over the place. And it's interesting the various routes he gets his material back to London. So at this point, he's obviously trying to get them sent round by boat. Um, again, with his fashion taste, he's being paid for a periwig for my master. Um, and then there's more detail in that little section as well about the various clothes that he has, because obviously he's in Venice, it's a very fashionable place. He can't possibly wear anything that he's bought prior to his visit. Um, and then at the bottom, there's this entry, which I think is interesting, which says paid for a chest for books with two locks. So he clearly knows that some of them are worth a lot of money and he wants them absolutely secure before he can risk sending them home. And then this final page is the final page in the accounts uh, for his trip. It then goes on to record some of his, his younger brother, Edward, came out to meet him in Paris. Um, and this is just before he's coming home. It's just before he has his birthday. Uh, we don't know for sure, but I'm pretty confident that he knows he's about to get married. So he's got an entry here paying um, we're in leaves now. He's paying 2,147 there. Then he's paying for um, 
paid for a month's riding in the academy for six horses. And then there's two lines below is for a dancing master. So he's still becoming this gentleman. He's obviously needs a little bit of practice. Um, and then there's this just small entry paid for a picture of Van Dyke, 4,500. And then he's remembering that he's on his way home because he's here, he's paid Mr. Barons for two weeks for Mr. Newton. Mr. Newton was one of his guardians. So I guess that's what he brought him back. And then this last entry here, paid for the Berliner. Now a Berliner, if you don't know, is the Ferrari of its day. He uh, bought a lovely carriage to take him back to England mm -hmm. in. And you know, he's often, there's a few letters that he writes to his guardians when he's away that have survived. And he's always saying about how he's become this virtuoso. He knows so much. He's brilliant. Can I have some more money? Can I have some more money? All the time he's asking for more money. And you just think this is a grand tour of epic proportions. And they kept buying him things as well. So this is an example of some of the things that he bought. Um, we've got the ancient sculpture of Diana, which he almost got locked up for. Uh, he didn't have the right paperwork when he wanted to buy it. This is the Van Dyke, which is huge. Those of you who have been into Holcomb will know that this picture and this one, the rape of Lucretia, are both in the saloon. Uh, they've always been in the saloon. They were designed to go in the saloon. So when he was still, what, 21, he was already designing a massive house with massive pictures um, to go in it. Uh, this is one of the many beautiful illustrated manuscripts that he brought back as well. Um, uh, this, oh, wait a minute, don't look there. This is uh, one of the old master drawings. This is a conquer uh, uh, Alexander giving Campanese to Appels. Not one that I'm particularly familiar with, but it's still there. And then this is another picture he commissioned um, and it's the Elysian Fields. And this, everybody's just getting on with what they're wanting to do in there. Everyone's not taking part in the action, except this chap over here, which again is another self-portrait of, well, not a self-portrait, it's another portrait of Thomas Cook. He got himself painted in there. And uh, it's, if you come to Holcomb, it's on the way to the libraries. It's above a massive staircase. And if you have a look at it, he's the only character that's actually looking out so as if to say, yet again, look, I've made it. Um, this is the lovely Marcus Aurelius. He bought a lot of busts and a lot of statues. And then I'm not sure if I need to introduce this document. Um, this is what's now known as Codex Lester. This was the Leonardo da Vinci manuscript that he just picked up and brought home, um, which unfortunately had to be sold in 1981 and was known as the Hammer Codex. But since Bill Gates has got it, is now known again as the Codex Lester. Um, and if you've been following uh, Lady Glen Connor, this is the document that she remembers turning the pages with her finger. So it will be covered with Glen Connor DNA on it as well. <clears throat> so he just bought and bought and bought. Um, but as we shall see, he didn't quite buy enough. Um, one of the people that he met whilst he was over in Rome was William Kent. Now, a lot of people have a lot of time for William Kent, but I'm afraid I see him as a bit of a social climber. I see him as finding Thomas Cook. He was over there already before Thomas came. He was They probably met um, in the studio of Chiari and the various Chiari pictures in the collection at Holcomb. Uh, and he was learning to train to be a painter. He had shown no interest in architecture, but along comes Thomas and suddenly William Kent becomes very keen on architecture and the pair of them travel around Northern Italy together. Thomas pays for him. Uh, William Kent gets ill. Thomas pays for William to get better. Um, and they both kind of use each other as time goes on to climb up for it. They did share many interests together. Uh, and they could indulge in various passions of art and architecture in ancient Rome. Um, and back on English soil, their friendship did continue. Um, and William Kent was the protege of the architect Earl, who's the Earl of Burlington, who was also a friend with Thomas Cook. 
And together, the three of them really shared this goal of wanting to promote Palladianism as a British style of architecture. Several of Kent's designs directly influenced the building of Helcom Hall, although the full extent of his involvement isn't really known because at this stage he was still very much a drawer rather than an architect per se. He never had any architectural training, but then of course you just need to go down to um, Whitehall and there's a lot of William Kent buildings down there. Um, Kent's designs are always a lot more sort of artistic rather than what was finally adopted. Um, and his work as a decorator and ornamentalist is far more obvious in the long library and in the marble hall. Um, so this at the right, this one is the uh, north front before the vestibule was built. So it doesn't quite look like that anymore. Um, and then up here is the um, triumphal arch, which when it was originally built did have those pyramids on the top. I don't know if many of people have, either if you've come by coach or if you've ignored the way out signs and have gone up past the obelisk um, and then gone down the huge long mile drive to the gates, the triumphal arch is just outside those gates and it is an amazing looking building and it would have looked even more amazing I think with those pyramids but they were removed um, within 75 years of them being put up there. So you might wonder about the ass that's in the Triumphal Arch. That was William Kent's joke. That's what his friends called him. So that's why he put it in the in the picture. And obviously the other one, the other picture of the North Front, we've got the lovely ostrich holding its horseshoe because that, of course, is by this point the fully adopted animal of the Cook family. So the other chap... Oh, there we go. Oh, too far. The other chap um, heavily associated with the design of Holcomb was the Norfolk builder come architect, Matthew Brettingham. Um, and it's recorded in the accounts in 1726 that he was paid 10 pounds for drawing a plan of the new house. So is that a plan that William Kent and Thomas Cook have come up with and he's as the kind of more fully trained is drawing? We don't know, um, but we do know that he was paid a lot of more money for a lot more years to keep working on building the house. Um, Brettingham would have had that kind of practical experience uh, and knew what could be achieved rather than the slightly more fanciful designs of Thomas and um, Kent. So after his work at Holcomb, he worked extensively as an architect, um, both refashioning London townhouses. Uh, he designed Kettleston Hall in Derbyshire and then more locally, he designed halls in Langley and Honingham and Gunton and Hanwell. <clears throat> he was really clever. He had a son helpfully called Matthew. Uh, and Matthew and Matthew set up a business together. Uh, Matthew sent Matthew, uh, the son, to learn architecture in Rome in 1747. And he was also sponsored by Thomas Cook, I think, as well. Um, William became quite a character out there. Uh, and was known to the other gentleman grand tourist. He was never there as a tourist, he was there to work. Um, so, uh, he's acting as agent uh, in Rome between 1747 and 1754. He'd already done work for Lord Orford down the road at Houghton, um, and his account book records, records items bought for Lord Leicester and for other people. Um, for people like um, Lord Dartmouth and things for his father as well. So on the entry on the right over here, uh, Brettingham records his purchases for Lord Leicester and it clean, includes details of busts, Piranesi drawings and paintings. The middle entry is, I think you can probably make out at the top, it says general account. Um, and uh, the general account the first two entries are Florence wine to be sent to Regal for the antiquaries for the antiquary with carriage. So obviously he's decided this would be a useful gift to give someone to maybe be able to negotiate a deal with them buying um, antiquaries, be able to bring back to the UK and then flog. Um, and then the second uh, entry is uh, chocolate for some occasion to be distributed. So he really he had, had a number of roles that he was out there. He was buying paintings and manuscripts 
uh, for Cook and for others. He was also buying um, ancient marbles and some of the some of the uh, ancient marbles at Holcomb he bought because he was in that slightly later generation of grand tourists and there were slightly more things available. Um, he also realised that people in these big houses didn't necessarily have to have the original, that they were quite keen to have copies. And so he was started either making moulds or getting moulds made but that they could then cast plaster casts back in the UK. So he was doing great things and together they were together Matthew and his father Matthew were um well they were just creaming off the desire to have um antiquities in houses I was really fortunate or I am really fortunate because working at the Holcomb Estate is brilliant and you get some brilliant things that you never think you're going to have and so this letter on the left hand side is an example of that um it came uh, with an envelope and the envelope had contemporary writing on saying this is very important but nothing had happened to it um, and it's been with Nick for a while as it got repaired but actually it's an un an unpublished unknown about letter between uh, Matthew Brettingham Senior sent to his son um, and in it he's kind of saying um, what's happened to the stuff uh, we know we've got six cases of moulds uh, which I hope will arrive soon in London. Um, if there's so much difficulty obtaining licenses for exportation of antique sculptures from Rome, I think you should give up. All further thoughts or concerns about them and be satisfied with the purchase you've already made of them. Uh, and if there's much trouble about it, well, don't bother. The, the bustos for the Earl of Leicester, get those. Give yourself no more trouble about them. His Lordship being well satisfied with you, with what you have already done for him. So clearly... Senior Brettingham is dealing with Thomas Cook and saying, these are the sort of things that Matt's picking up and is there anything else that you want and being the go-between. Uh, but he doesn't really know also what it is that he's describing because uh, <clears throat> he says uh, he's asking for Matthew to get something to go with a statue that's already Holcomb. I think the companion to your fawn with a goat upon his shoulder should be a drapey figure. <laughs> and he's obviously got an idea of what would look good, but without knowing exactly what was there. And of course, one of the interesting things is when you do look at the sculpture at Holcomb is what Matthew was buying and what Thomas was buying very much fitted in with what the seller realised they wanted. And it's not necessarily the same thing as what modern day experts think that the uh, the studies actually are. Um, so if you wanted a a Venus de Milo, we can get you a Venus de Milo, it just might not quite look as you might expect. So, so Thomas Cook started to build his house in 1734 when his money had, had sort of got into a better state uh, and he built the obelisk first. He had married Margaret Tufton, uh, who was Baroness Clifton in her own right, and they would return to Holcombe um, every uh every autumn to come and see how the house was progressing and then return to London for the season. In 1722, um, Thomas was elected MP for Norfolk and he was a great supporter of his neighbour, Robert Walpole. Three years later, Cook was appointed Knight of the Bath, Knight of the Order of the Bath, and in 1728, he was elevated to the peerage as Baron Lovell of Minster Lovell in Oxfordshire. And that's one of the big houses that uh, Edward Cook had bought. In 1734, he began building his vision for Holcomb. Um, and in 1744, he was ennobled as the Earl of Leicester. And this is, is his document that says his grant to be Earl of Leicester. Um, his heir and only surviving child, Edward, had uh, died in 1753. He had a rather dissolute life. You know, he was the child that had everything, but that wasn't enough. Um, and after Edward had died, Thomas pretty much withdrew from London life uh, and he threw himself into completion of the hall, which sadly he never saw. He died in 1759, aged just 63, which leads us nicely on. To the ever brilliant Margaret. Um, this is Margaret here on the, uh, on the, the picture and that's 
the young Edward beside her. Um, the ever brilliant Margaret continued her husband's work at Holcombe and completed the hall mostly to his plans, but she did make some of the decisions herself. Um, and she was left an annuity by Thomas to continue building the hall uh, with to his specifications. Um, but she records in her account book when she'd had to dip into her, her own money to pay for items for the new house that couldn't have been included in his money for her. I think she must have been a really remarkable woman um, for putting up with Thomas. He had quite a reputation in London and she must have seen Holcomb as a bit of an escape. She had various miscarriages and stillbirths and it was a really tragic life. Um, she established the arms houses in Holcomb in the 1750s and they come with a really, really strict set of rules. Um, who can be in there, what they can do, what they can wear, what they can't do. Um, she also regularly gave money to the poor of Holcombe. And because the Holcombe estate wasn't then all totally owned by the family, there were still independent people there, that didn't matter. She would give money to whoever needed it. Obviously, you had to be poor enough, but she would give money to you. Um, she would give out warm coats, which were expected to last three years, and they were recorded when they went to the next person, um, either when they'd grown, presumably, or died. Uh, she also gave out flour and beef measured in stones at Christmas, which is quite a hugely amount, again, to the deserving poor. Um, and she was one of the first people to pay for uh, a refurbishment in St. Withburgus Church. On the death of her husband in 1759, she completed an inventory of which this is the first page. This is the landscape room. You can see just at the top, it says landscape room here. Um, it's the first catalogue we have for knowing what went where. Um, and obviously later generations had their own ideas and thought that their hang was infinitely better. However, in the 1990s, the seventh Earl, the one before the current one, uh, used this to recreate the original hang in the hall, which is what makes Holcomb so special is that we say we are an 18th century Palladian house because everything we've got is in the place where it should be, as far as we can tell. Um, Lady Margaret continued to live into the hall until her death in 1775. The estate was inherited by her nephew, Wenman Cook. Now, Wenman Cook was um, the son of Thomas's sister. So he wasn't really a cook, but he changed his name because he thought that he would become the heir and that would be useful for him. Um, I think it's best to say that, or it's fair to say at best, Margaret tolerated Wenman. Um, she didn't really get on very well with him, but she did get on really well with his son, Thomas William Cook. Again, she did not want him to go to university. Um, she even paid him an allowance or increased his allowance and encouraged him to go on his own grand tour. Um, it didn't last as long and he didn't buy as much, but he did have fun. So Thomas William Cook, or Cook of Norfolk as we know him, was born in 1754. Um, he spent his early life at Longford Hall, Derbyshire, and he was educated at Eton. He's the first one of the cooks to be educated at Eton, or the cooks now the cooks in the main throw line go to Eton. Um, yes, uh, Lady Margaret described universities as one of those schools of vice, the universities, and significantly increased his allowance. Um, Thomas spent a month with Margaret before embarking on his own grand tour. Um, and as a young man, he was terribly attractive and acquired the soubriquet La Belle Anglaise. And he would attend balls and mask in magnificent style and famously dance with the princess Louise of Stolberg, the new wife of the exiled Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, and it's reputed that they had may have had a little affair together, but maybe not. So this is the rather dashing Thomas William Cook, a little bit older, uh, maybe a little bit wiser. Thomas returned to England in 1774 and within a year turned 21 and married Jane Dutton. Together they had three beautiful daughters, Jane, Anne and Elizabeth. Um, and on the death of his father, Thomas inherited Holcombe and was returned for MP for the county. He was a staunch Whig and was a great supporter of Charles Fox. He spoke keenly on agricultural matters and sat for 56 years, only broken between 1784 and 1790. He threw himself into agricultural improvement upon the estate. He was the one that established the sheep shearing, which we now 
um, say, is the forerunner to the county show. Um, it was a place where stockmen, farmers, gentlemen and gentry would come and discuss as equals and eat as equals in the hall. Um, the new methods of animal husbandry and farming, including the four course rotation of turnips, barley, grass and corn. And with the architect Samuel Wyatt, Thomas heavily uh, invested heavily in constructing new farmer houses and associated buildings. However, there is absolutely no, we know Samuel Wyatt did it, but there's no records left of what exactly Samuel Wyatt did. Um, so we know which building, but unfortunately there's no plans. Rather surprisingly, after being a widower for 22 years, Thomas married his young goddaughter, Lady Anne Keppel, and together they had five sons and a daughter. Um, he was heir to, an, heir to inherit the vastly improved estates. Uh, Thomas died in, 17, in 1842 and his body was brought back to Norfolk, where thousands of people are reported to have paid their respects and the funeral procession was two miles long in length and he's buried in, in Tittershall. And of course, when you come to Holcombe, you've got the obelisk on one side of the hall and you've got the massive uh, cook um, monument on the other side, which one of his daughters thought was absolutely awful and it really didn't fit in with anything that they wanted. So the painting on the right is the Gainsborough of Thomas and it shows him as a rather young man uh, surrounded by Columba Spaniels. I'm not a dog person, but I had uh, somebody from the Dog Museum in New York tell me most profusely that they're Columba Spaniels and somebody else has said, oh yes, that's definitely them. Uh, what you can see, which is quite interesting, is this seal uh, that's hanging down here, the chain or the, the ribbon that his seal's hanging on is blue, which is not, uh, this is not a subtle mark to show his um, dedication to the American cause in there. The map on the left shows the Holcomb estate not long after he inherited it. So you can see the hall here. And you, this building over here is the stables, which have moved. There's still a few, few bits of village left. Uh, and obviously the bits where you come now for the cafe and the stables as we know them are yet to be built. And interestingly up here is the village. And again, there's not that much going on at this point. You can see there's been funny things done to the lake and there's still a bit of very old basin in front of the house, which was linked by a little canal to the lake. I've got a bigger slide that says, yeah, there you can see more easily perhaps the basin. You've still got the views here that were set out. This is the obelisk and the walks and the views that you've got. Holcomb Church is still in the same place, obviously. What's interesting, I think, as well, is you've still got all these fields. You haven't got the parkland like we imagine Holcomb to be today. Right, I get very excited about this. Humphrey Repton. We have the first Red Book. We had the Red Book before Red Books were even invented. Humphrey Repton was um, a friend of Thomas Cook and again, um, another of these social climbers really. Um, he produced the Red Book for Holcomb in 1789 and it was a really kind of a, a test piece to see what he could do in it. We don't have any of the lovely flaps but we do have the, or the before and after, we just have the after pictures of what could be used to be, to uh, to make the land better. Um, it's full of persuasive text to Mrs. Cook, not to um, Thomas William. Uh, and it's not really known how much of the ambitious plan that he set out was actually uh, carried out. One thing that he really wanted was to have um, a ferry across the lake, this ferry here. And he does, in the text, it says that he wants it to be suitable for a lady to be able to use. Um, I had an engineer that was coming to have a look at something else and he wanted to have a look at this because he'd heard about it. And he was very unconvinced that it would ever possibly work, that it was a nice idea, but it's just a sort of marketing. These are kind of things you might want to do for it. Um, Thomas, by this point, 
by the time Repton came, he had already extended the lake. So it's got the nice curve at the top, which you still see to it. And he'd also put it down at the north end, going far more into the marshes. Um, and he'd demolished the kitchen gardens. So some of the walks that uh, Repton suggested probably were included, um, but just not quite everything. Um, in their account in 1802, there's reference to a subterraneous passage leading to the garden, which was possibly Repton's creeper covered tunnel. Um, Repton himself claimed that the walks at least had been constructed, but the whole idea of being a wig house and having a red book was really important. You can go up and down the country and those wig houses will have the red books and they will shout about them. It was like your coffee table. Oh, look, we've had Repton in. This is what we're thinking of doing. Um, how much he actually did or not is a different matter. One of the other key characters that's really important to um, Thomas William Cook is this dour looking Scotsman on the right. This is the brilliant Francis Blakey and he was the first proper agent on the estate. He worked from 1816 to 1832 uh, and he was brought in really to tighten up farming practices across the estate. And one of the first things he did was to undertake a survey of what he found. Um, and this is an entry for Qualls, but at the beginning, he has a little introductory thing. And uh, he's saying he's had the honour of being engaged to serve Thomas William Cook Esquire in the capacity of steward over his extensive estates in Norfolk. Uh, uh, and he's going to be looking at everything very carefully, but, um, but he's not sure whether he's necessarily been totally true on everything because of course he is a newcomer and uh, or a stranger and that the, some things might be to do with location and localities of situation so he might not get everything right so he's really kind of covering his back anyway he writes for this uh farm in quals which is to the southern end of the estate um near uh the triumphal arch that um he writes a review of the farmer who's Mr. Edmund Hedgrins. He's got a bond on lease for 19 years. Uh, the greater part of the buildings are in good repair. The farmhouse in particular is conveniently arranged and neatly fitted up. Not insured tenant, not bound to insure by the covenants of his lease. Tithe free, no poor, cult no poor cultivates upon the four course shift. Land not clean and has the appearance of being overcropped. More reliance have been placed upon oil cake than on proper husbandry of farmyard manure. The greater part of this farm is two weak soil to support a four course shift. It is more adapted for an alternate four and five course shifts with two layers. And he's quite damning on a lot of the farms across the estate. Um, but the bit that I really like is the fact that the bit that he says at the end that Mr. Hegrin is a well-educated man, but more of a theorist than an attentive, persevering, practical farmer. So I'm not quite sure how much longer he would have managed to stay for that. So I shall finish by telling you about when Thomas Cook, he was finally, Thomas William Cook was finally created Earl of Leicester. So we've had two uh, versions of being Earl of Leicester. He was finally made um, Earl of Leicester with uh, following Queen Victoria's ascension in 1837. He'd refused it before and he'd pretty much fallen out with uh, George III over America. So he waited and waited. And then Victoria famously came to stay at Holcombe uh, as a princess. And then he very quickly agreed after that that he would become Earl of Leicester. <laughs>